A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 3 from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms textbook. This chapter covers microbial metabolism, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, if you need a refresher, I have several videos already posted on the YouTube channel, Dr. D Explains Stuff. Uh, I have cellular respiration video. I believe this one links to my cellular respiration explained video. And then if you go to my Biology 1406 Chapter 7 Part 1 and Chapter 7 Part 2 videos, I discuss cellular respiration and fermentation. And if you look at the Biology 1406 Chapter 8 video, I have a great refresher on photosynthesis. So um, because all of you should have covered cellular respiration, fermentation, and photosynthesis in Biology 1406, I'm not going to re-explain all of those concepts. I'm going to assume that for the most part you know these concepts. Uh, and if you need a refresher, again, please click on these for that refresher. But let's carry on with this chapter. Some terms to know. Metabolism, this should be a review of 1406 again. It's the sum or totality of the chemical reactions inside of a cell. And this, this has two prongs. Catabolic reactions, also known as catabolism, where molecules are usually broken down and this releases energy. And anabolic reactions, or anabolism, where energy is usually required to build things up. Uh, so again, energy is released in catabolism, energy is required for anabolism. And re remember that nutrients are required for growth and for the production of the biomolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. Again, nutrients are required for uh, you know, uh, to produce monomers or precursors of these monomers so that organisms can grow. And microorganisms are no exception. They require nutrients. Some nutrients you need in large quantities. These are called the macronutrients. And some you need in minute or smaller quantities. These are the micronutrients, also known as the trace elements. So here you can see the periodic table of elements and the elements colored in yellow are the elements that you need in substantial amounts uh, for microorganisms. So you need hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on for uh, microorganisms. And then the essential cations or anions are in salmon color, trace metals are in green, used for special functions, that's lilac, and then you have other elements as well. But one thing I want you guys to realize is that the elements that organisms need an abundance of are carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Because carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are required by all of your biomolecules. I have a nice picture here I want to show you real quick. Here you can see your biomolecules. Remember the proteins, the nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. Notice how proteins require carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur. Nucleic acids require carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Lipids require carbon, hydrogen, oxy oxygen, phosphorus, and carbohydrates, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So obviously these elements are macronutrients. These elements you need an abundance of in order to grow and for, uh, re for cellular division, cell growth, etc. Here's just a table highlighting macro, uh, micronutrients needed by microorganisms. Again, I told you that carbon is required by all cells. This is why we are known as carbon-based life forms. Carbon makes up the backbone of all of our biomolecules. It is essential 
Heterotrophs, they obtain their carbon through organic sources. Autotrophs, they obtain their carbon through CO2. I'm going to go through and explain in more detail the nutritional type heterotroph, the nutritional type autotroph. We're going to get there in a little bit. Nitrogen's also required in heavy amounts in organisms. Why? Because it's required by proteins, nucleic acids, other cellular constituents. Other macronutrients include phosphorus. Remember your, your phospholipids and your nucleic acids require phosphorus. Sulfur. You need sulfur for your uh, amino acids. Uh, there's a couple of amino acids, cysteine and methionine, that require sulfur. And some of the vitamins require sulfur as well as coenzyme A. Potassium is required for activity of the cell. Magnesium is required. Calcium is required. Sodium is required. Iron is required. Uh, it's a key component of cytochromes in microorganisms and iron sulfide proteins involved in electron transport. If you remember in the electron transport chain you have a lot of iron containing prosthetic groups or cofactors required for the proper movement of the electrons through the electron transport chain. Growth factors are required. These are organic compounds required by microorganisms in order to grow. Examples are vitamins, amino acids, purines, pyrimidines, and of course the vitamins in general are growth factors. How do we get these micronutrients and macronutrients into the cell? A lot of times you have active transport involved where you utilize energy in order to bring in nutrients into the cell. There are three classes of transporters, simple transporters, there are group translocators, and the ABC system. Now moving on to energy classes of microorganisms. So we're going to learn about the nutritional types of, micro, of uh, microorganisms. These will include uh, chemoorganotrophs, chemolithotrophs, phototrophs, heterotrophs, autotrophs. So let me explain to you what all this means because based on the nutritional types of microorganisms you can categorize microorganisms. Uh, for example, a, a photolitho autotroph will obtain nutrients in one way whereas a chemoorganoheterotroph will obtain its nutrients another way so these are long intimidating names. What do they all mean? What is a photolitho autotroph? What is a photoorganoheterotroph? It sounds very long, very intimidating, but what does it really mean? What, what does this uh, stand for? Well, it all depends on where an organism obtains its carbon, where an organism obtains its electrons, and where an organism obtains its energy. Okay, so let's break it down for you. Uh, there's a nice slide that I like to use. Uh, let's break it down this way. Here, let's break it down this way. Heterotrophs versus autotrophs. Here we're talking about where an organism obtains its carbon, the carbon source of organisms. Okay, Heterotrophs obtain their carbon from preformed organic molecules. So for example, sugars, fats, etc. Autotrophs obtain their carbon from CO2, from carbon fixation, CO2 fixation from the air. Did you follow that? So the difference between a heterotroph and an autotroph is where are you getting your carbon? Heterotroph obtains carbon from organic materials organic molecules such as sugars, autotrophs obtain their carbons from the air, from, uh, from carbon fixation. Now let's discuss the difference between phototrophs and chemotrophs. A phototroph and a chemotroph, this, this, uh, these are where an organism obtains its energy. Where does an organism obtain energy? A phototroph obtains its energy in the form of light, so it's a light harvester for energy. A chemotroph obtains its energy from a chemical, 
and this chemical could be an organic chemical or an inorganic chemical. Lastly, let's discuss the difference between lithotrophs and organotrophs. This all has to do with where an organism obtains its electrons from. Lithotrophs obtain their electrons from inorganic substances, whereas organotrophs obtain electrons from organic compounds. So now that we know these terms, you could go back to this table that was, remember, with these long, intimidating nutritional type names, and you can actually start breaking it down. For example, a plant or tree or photosynthesizer like a uh, cyanobacteria or algae or diatom would be a photolithoautotroph. Why? Because remember, photo means you get your energy from light. Litho means you reduce uh, inorganic matter, in this case, inorganic. Uh, remember that uh, plants and photosynthesizers typically use water as their electron source. Water is an inorganic electron source. And then autotroph, meaning you, the plant will obtain its carbon uh, in the form of CO2 through carbon fixation, remember during the Calvin cycle. Humans on the other hand would be considered chemo organoheterotrophs. Chemo, chemo organoheterotrophs. In this case we are gaining our, uh, our carbon from uh, organic compound like sugar. We are getting our energy through organic chemicals such as sugar also and we are getting our electrons from the sugar as well. So again, it's an organic donor. Uh, so we, as humans, are chemo-organoheterotrophs. Plants would be photolithoautotrophs. But in the microbial world, you can have all different combinations of these types of nutritional types. So these organisms here would be considered chemolithoautotrophs, whereas some of these sulfur-oxidizing bacterium they would be chemolithoheterotrophs. There's quite an array, quite a myriad of different nutritional types out there when you're discussing microorganisms. Next, let's discuss some catabolism. Specifically, this should be mostly a review, but cellular respiration and fermentation. Now, during catabolism, your body and cellular respiration in general is able to take polysaccharides, phospholipids, proteins, and other kinds of lipids uh, in general, fats in general, and it's able to catabolize these for energy. Proteins can be broken down and added to the, uh, to the Krebs cycle sugars are broken down and added to the Krebs cycle for harvesting of electrons and fats are also broken down and added to the Krebs cycle through for uh, harvesting of electrons. Remember from Biology 1406 that the main point of cellular respiration is to generate ATP but the way this is done is by taking proteins, sugars, or fats, harvesting their electrons, handing those electrons to electron carriers such as NAD plus and FAD, and allowing those NADH and FADH2, those reduced transporters, to then transport the electrons to the electron transport chain. And we can gain, you see here, we can gain NAD H and FADH2 from these processes, from glycolysis, from oxidation of pyruvate, from the Krebs cycle itself. So we can get energy, but remember that you can get more energy from fats. To a lesser extent, you can gain energy from sugars, and uh, the least would be the energy obtained from proteins. So let's talk first about cellular respiration. Do you recall the steps of cellular respiration? First we have glycolysis. There are different routes glycolysis can take, these three routes here, but usually, usually depending on the textbook, the term glycoly glycolysis might refer to all three of these or to just the Ebden 
Mayerhoff pathway. So let's talk about that standard pathway. So here we go. This here is a standard glycolysis pathway. Remember that you start with an energy investment phase where you're priming the pump so that you can make more energy later. During this energy investment phase, you're expending two ATP. Two ATP are being used in order to phosphorylate glucose at carbons one and six and isomerizing glucose to fructose so that you end up with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate at the cost of 2 ATP. At this point, the enzymes come in and uh, cleave. You cleave fructose into half, and you have two 3-carbon molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So now you have two shorter sugars of glyceraldehyde, and you have the third carbon has a phosphate group. So the reason you have two columns here is because whatever is happening in the first column is also happening in the second column. At this point, we can start harvesting electrons. Remember, the whole point of glycolysis and uh, the Krebs cycle is to harvest electrons from this sugar so that you know, there are hydrogens that you can take from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and it's with the help of an enzyme called NAD plus reductase. The NAD plus reductase will take, uh, take hydrogens from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate in order to reduce NAD plus to NADH. They're also called dehydrogenases, by the way. These are uh, dehydrogenases because they're taking hydrogens from this, these sugars and handing them to the electron carriers. Remember nicotinamide, adenosine dinucleotide, the, the electron carrier, NAD+. NAD+, is then reduced to NADH. And remember, that's happening twice because we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. At this point, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is also becoming phosphorylated again with an inorganic phosphate. So, you're, so now we have a doubly phosphorylated sugar called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and we have two of those. Now is the payoff phase of glycolysis. We are going to take these phosphate groups from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. We are going to transfer these phosphate groups to ADP in order to form ATP. So ADP will be phosphorylated to ATP. Where does that terminal phosphate come from? It comes from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. By the way, the process of taking a phosphate group from an organic source from a molecule like this, uh, a high-energy molecule, the, the process of transferring a phosphate group to, to make ATP is called substrate-level phosphorylation. Let me read the definition. The formation of high-energy phosphate bonds by phosphorylation, example ADP to ATP, coupled to cleavage of a high energy metabolic intermediate. That is what substrate level phosphorylation is. See, here uh, in this case, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is your high energy metabolic in intermediate, and you're using that high energy metabolic intermediate in order to serve as the source of the phosphate group in order to phosphorylate ADP to ATP. So here, the ATP that's made here, uh, this ATP is made by substrate level phosphorylation. So now, obviously, you're left with only one phosphate group attached to your phosphoglycerate. So this is called 3-phosphoglycerate. And then after a couple of steps, rearrangement steps, another, another phosphate group is taken from your sugar, added to ADP to make ATP leaving you with a three carbon molecule, actually two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Again, the phosphorylation event that happened here is called substrate level phosphorylation to make this ATP. So four ATP were made during glycolysis via substrate level phosphorylation. And also don't forget two NADH were formed uh, during dehydrogenase activity. So NAD plus was reduced to NADH twice. But don't forget, you, you expended 2 ATP at the beginning, 
So at the cost of two ATP, you made four. So we say you netted two ATP. The process of glycolysis nets two ATP. It also produces two NADH and your glucose becomes oxidized to two molecules of pyruvate. And those are the products of glycolysis. Next, let's review the TCA cycle. Remember, that's also known as the Krebs cycle and the citric acid cycle. And don't forget, before you actually get to the cycle, you have a half step here called oxidation of pyruvate. Remember, in Biology 1406, where pyruvate is oxidized to acetyl-CoA, that means electrons were removed from pyruvate, and those electrons were handed to NAD plus to reduce it to NADH. NADH then obviously goes off to the electron transport chain. And in this process, remember one of the carbons from the pyruvate molecule, one of these three carbons, I believe it's the top one here, leaves as CO2 waste product. So now you have a two carbon molecule called acetyl-CoA. And remember everything I just mentioned, step one here, uh, highlighted in this image, uh, step one is called oxidation of pyruvate. Now you have acetyl-CoA as a product of oxidation of pyruvate. You have two acetyl-CoA. Remember, why do I say two acetyl-CoA? Well, because two pyruvate are formed per glucose, two acetyl-CoA are then produced from those two pyruvate, which means you've produced two NADH and two CO2 at this point per glucose. Now you're ready for the TCA cycle, aka Krebs cycle, aka citric acid cycle. And what happens during this cycle? Your acetyl-CoA joins up with this, uh, this Krebs cycle uh, product called oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is an organic molecule which will bind to acetyl-CoA, releasing the CoA, the coenzyme A, to form citrate. And by the way, citrate is citric acid, and that's why this cycle is called the citric acid cycle because the first thing you do is to form citric acid or citrate. Citrate is then, you don't need to know every single little step, but citrate is then oxidized after it's you know changed to isocitrate acid. It is oxidized, so two electrons and a proton are given to NAD plus to reduce it to NADH. This releases a CO2 molecule. You then form alpha ketoglutarate. Again, you oxidize alpha ketoglutarate. You give those electrons and a proton to NAD plus to form NADH, releasing another CO2 to form succinyl-CoA. Succinyl-CoA is then used in order to uh, generate GTP, which is, uh, you know, essentially ATP. It's, it's an it's a energy molecule, and GTP can be used to make ATP. So here, through substrate-level phosphorylation, an ATP is made. Next, you're left with succinate. Succinate is uh, oxidized by, you know, an enzyme, and those electrons and protons are given to FAD, reducing it to FADH2. You're left with fumarate. Fumarate is then tr uh, transformed to malate. Malate is oxidized. So the electrons are, uh, and a proton are given to NAD+, reducing it to NADH. And at the end of the cycle, you need to know that at the end of the TCA cycle, you are left with oxaloacetate. And oxaloacetate is produced at the end of this cycle in order to accept the next acetyl-CoA and continue on with the next cycle. So what do I need you to know? Do I need you to know each and every little step here? No, but here are the things I want you to know. During oxidation of pyruvate, during oxidation of pyruvate, pyruvate is oxidized to acetyl-CoA. Uh, NADH is formed and CO2 is formed. Acetyl-CoA then comes to the Krebs cycle and binds to oxaloacetate, forming citrate. And through a number of steps, through a number of steps, citrate uh, becomes oxidized to oxaloacetate in the process. One, two, 
three NADH are formed, one FADH2 is formed, and one GTP, aka ATP, is formed as well through substrate level phosphorylation. Also, two CO2 molecules are released. Two CO2 molecules are released. And if I were to ask you what uh, these, these uh, products are in terms of one glucose molecule, remember that you don't have one pyruvate from uh, glycolysis. You have two pyruvates incoming from glycolysis. So you would multiply all your numbers that you see here on this figure you would mul multiply it by two because you have two pyruvates. This would result in the formation of two acetyl-CoA's. So that would result in two rounds of the TCA cycle. Okay, now let's review the electron transport chain, which comes next. Recall that all of the NADH and FADH2, FADH2 coming in here, all of the NADH and FADH2 produced during glycolysis, which was 2, 2NADH, uh, uh, oxidation of pyruvate, which was 2NADH, and the citric acid cycle, which was 6NADH, and 2 FADH2, all of those NADH and FADH are heading to the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is found in the inner membrane of the mitochondria of eukaryotes, but it is found in the plasma membrane of uh, prokaryotes. So that NADH is on its way to the electron transport chain in order to drop off its electron cargo into the electron transport chain to power the electron transport chain. NADH drops off its electrons at complex one of the electron transport chain, whereas FADH2, if I were to draw it here, FADH2 drops off its electrons here at complex two of the electron transport chain, uh, bypassing uh, complex one. Those electrons then move through the electron transport chain to the complex four where they are picked up by a terminal electron acceptor and remember during aerobic cellular respiration the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen oxygen picks up the electrons and is reduced to water h2o so let's look here again at what happens nadh drops off its electrons those electrons move from uh, prosthetic group to prosthetic group prosthetic groups are kind of like uh, cofactors in that they but the only difference is that they are more permanent inside of these complexes so the electrons move from FMN to FES to FES to coenzyme Q to site BL site BH FES site C1 site to chrome C site A site A3 and on to oxygen where oxygen picks up the electrons it is the terminal electron acceptor and recall that electrons are moving from molecules of lower reduction potential, standard reduction potential, which is denoted as E sub O. Uh, the electrons are moving from lower reduction potential to higher reduction potential. You can think of reduction potential, if you recall from biology 1406, as the affinity of molecules for electrons. NADH has the lowest, if you look here, NADH has the lowest reduction potential with a negative reduction potential, whereas at the end of this chain you have oxygen, oxygen being the most positive in reduction potential. So oxygen can actually, I think that was a mosquito. Uh, sorry, I think I heard a mosquito and I felt it land on my, my neck. Gosh. So again, uh, during the whole process of cellular respiration, you have electrons moving from lower reduction potential molecules like glucose, NADH, FADH2. Those electrons move from lower reduction potential molecules on and on and on to higher and higher reduction potential. And the electron transport chain actually arranges itself from low 
reduction potential to higher with complex complex two to higher with complex three and highest with complex four. Uh, and with the oxygen that comes up as the terminal electron acceptor being the highest reduction potential molecule, it is able to pick up the electrons at the end of the ride. That is why it is a good oxidizer and it is great for the, serving as the terminal electron acceptor. So as those electrons move spontaneously uh, through the electron transport chain, remember spontaneous move spontaneous processes such as this flow of electrons down the reduction potential gradient spontaneous processes release energy remember exergonic reactions release energy that energy can be coupled to an endergonic reaction that requires energy such as active transport protons are actively transported through complexes one three and four and the energy provided for active transport is the spontaneous process of electron flow. Isn't that cool? So electrons flow spontaneously, spontaneous processes release energy. That energy is used to power these pumps. Pumps, proton pump one, proton pump three, proton pump four, pump protons actively. This creates a high proton concentration either in the intermembrane space of a mitochondria or outside of the cell in a prokaryote. Those protons then force their way through this enzyme, ATP synthase, allowing ATP synthase to spin and thereby uh, promoting phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. You're forming ATP, uh, and this is called oxidative phosphorylation, by the way, now, real quick, those protons diffusing down its concentration gradient from, again, either the intermembrane space or outside of the cell, those protons diffusing in uh, actually generates the power required to form ATP. So again, here's an example of a spontaneous reaction. That's chemiosmosis of protons, the flow of protons down their concentration gradient. Those protons are spontaneously moving across ATP synthase. This spins uh, ATP synthase and provides the energy required for ATP production. ATP production. Now, next let's discuss how during oxidative phosphorylation, during ATP production uh, with oxidative phosphorylation, the third uh, and final step of, of uh, cellular respiration, let's discuss the PO ratio. Um, now, the PO ratio has to do with how many ATP are formed per NADH oxidized or per FADH2 oxidized. Let's look at here. Every time NADH drops off its electrons, those electrons move through the electron transport chain, thereby pumping protons. The question is, how many protons are pumped? How many ATP is made? And so the answer is, every time NADH drops off the electrons, 10 protons are pumped. 10 protons are pumped. And then it takes four, it takes four through chemiosmosis and to transport ADP to the ATP synthase, it takes four to make an ATP. So by that math, 10 protons pumped, it takes four to make ATP. The answer for the PO ratio of NADH would be 10 over 4 or 2.5. Does that make sense? Next, let's talk about the PO ratio of FADH2. FADH2 drops off its electrons here. It bypasses pump 1. So every time FADH2 moves through the electron transport chain, uh, because you're bypassing pump 1, only 6 protons are pumped. And remember, it takes four to form ATP. So in this case, the PO ratio of FADH2 is six protons pump divided by four protons to make ATP, so 1.5. Did you follow that? So the PO ratio of NADH is 2.5 and the, and the PO ratio of FADH2 is only 1.5.
And again, if any of this is uh, not making sense or unclear, remember this is everything I have talked about about cellular respiration so far with glycolysis to oxidation of pyruvate to uh, Krebs cycle to oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis and PO ratios was all review from Biology 1406. So watch those videos that I highlighted earlier in the chapter and those will help you to really understand and grasp this material. So with that, actually, let's take this opportunity to take a quick little break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll be right back to finish this chapter. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's carry on with this chapter covering metabolism. Here you can see that what we had just finished covering was aerobic cellular respiration. Now, what is the difference between that and anaerobic respiration, also known as anaerobic cellular respiration? The only difference that I need you to know is that during anaerobic respiration, you are using an electron acceptor, a uh, terminal electron acceptor other than oxygen. So what is picking up the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain is a molecule that's oxidative but not oxygen, such as nitrate, ferric iron, sulfate, carbon dioxide, other organic compounds such as fumarate. So you still utilize an, uh, uh, an electron transport chain in order to create a proton gradient, utilize the proton motive force with chemiosmosis to drive ATP synthase to make ATP. However, instead of using oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor, you're using one of these oxidative molecules instead. Now, because none of these are as oxidative as oxygen, you are not going to get as much energy. You're not going to get as much ATP. So you tend to have less ATP produced during anaerobic respiration than you know, the, the full complement that you see with aerobic respiration. So here you can see aerobic respiration electron acceptor is oxygen which gets reduced to water. This is found in all aerobic bacteria, fungi, and protists. With anaerobic you can see you can have nitrate, uh, nitrate, nitrite, um, uh, nitrite, nit uh, you could have sulfate, so here you could have nitrate reduced to nitrite, nitrate reduced to nitrite, to nitrogen gas, to nitrate oxide. You can have sodium, uh, sulfate reduced to so, so, uh, hydrogen sulfide. You can have carbon dioxide reduced to methane. So you get it, you can use, you can use all of these different electron acceptors, which are uh, electronegative. They have a very high uh, reduction potential, remember E sub O, and these, these uh, electron acceptors are reduced uh, during the process of uh, electron transport, at the end of the electron transport chain. And again, what did I say? Um, these have less energy yields because the reduction potential of these acceptors are less positive than that of oxygen. Now let's discuss fermentation. We've discussed aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration. Now let's discuss fermentation, which is its own thing. Let me explain something real quick. You see here, during oxidative phosphorylation, the third part of cellular respiration, the last part of cellular respiration, 
in order to keep the electron transport chain moving, you need a terminal electron acceptor to pick up the electrons at the end of the, the electron transport chain. And remember, oxygen becomes reduced to water. Now, what if you don't have enough uh, terminal electron acceptor? So for aerobes, uh, the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen. What if you don't have enough oxygen? Or if you're an anaerobic respirator, what if you don't have enough uh, sulfate or nitrate? You know, what if you don't have a terminal electron acceptor available? Well, that is when you switch to fermentation, okay? Uh, anaerobic respiration and fermentation, I need you to know that they are not the same thing. During anaerobic respiration, what, what that means is you have a different terminal electron acceptor picking up the electron, something other than oxygen. During fermentation, which is an anaerobic process, but it is not anaerobic respiration, that's when you don't have enough terminal electron acceptor, regardless of what it, its identity is. What that means is you shut down the electron transport chain, thereby you shut down oxidative phosphorylation. You shut down, let's go back. You shut down the Krebs cycle. You shut down the Krebs cycle. You shut down oxidative phosphorylation, or see, sorry, uh, oxidation of pyruvate. You shut down oxida uh, oxidation of pyruvate. And the only thing that continues to chug along is glycolysis. So again, during fermentation, which is an anaerobic process, but it is not anaerobic respiration, um, you have only glycolysis. So you can see here, this is glycolysis. You have you start with glucose and you end with pyruvate during glycolysis. In the meantime, you produce two NADH. You also produce two ATP, which they have not denoted here. And you cannot move on to the Krebs cycle. You cannot move on to the next step, which was actually oxidation of pyruvate, you can't move on to the Krebs cycle, you can't move on to the electron transport chain, and the reason being that those are shut down. And the only thing that's continued to go is the glycolysis, uh, the glycolysis uh, process. So here's the issue, remember this from 1406, that during glycolysis you are reducing NAD plus to NADH and the more this occurs the more you deplete your stores of NAD plus all of it becomes reduced to NADH so you need a way to to re, uh, oxidize um, to oxidize NADH back to NAD plus uh, normally that's not a problem because NADH heads over to the electron transport chain, NADH reduces the electron transport chain and that's how you get oxidized back to NAD+. However, remember during fermentation you don't have a terminal electron acceptor and that's not an option. So your NADH starts to accumulate and your NAD plus starts to deplete. So to prevent you from running out of NAD D+, because you know, the cell doesn't have an infinite amount of NAD+, so it needs to regenerate NAD+, what uh, occurs during fermentation is that you need to oxidize NADH. And the way to do that is to oxidize a product, a downstream product of glucose uh, you know, processing. So in uh, you and I, we, we, we do it this way. We take our NADH and we actually reduce, we give the H's, we give the two electrons and a proton. We, we reduce pyruvate to lactic acid, also known as lactate. That generates NAD plus for us, which can cycle back and uh, collect more electrons from glucose, oxidizing glucose to pyruvate. Um, other creatures, uh, you need to know that other microorganisms can they could they could do the same thing they could reduce pyruvate to lactic la, uh, lactate or they could uh, break down pyruvate into some other intermediary and then reduce that and that's how you end up with uh, various fermentation products 
And I'm going to explain a few of those in a little bit. But the whole idea of fermentation is that because there's a limit, uh, limited supply of terminal electron accept, uh, acceptor uh, for aerobes being oxygen, for anaerobes being sulfate or nitrate or something, um, everything shuts down except glycolysis. And during glycolysis, if you're only doing glycolysis, you're producing NADH from NAD+. And in order to avoid losing all of your NAD+, uh, as it converts to NADH, you must reduce some product of glycolysis. If you, if you reduce pyruvate directly to lactic acid, um, you know, that's what, that's what a, a lactic acid fermenter does. But if you reduce a downstream byproduct of pyruvate, that's how you end up with ethanol or isopropanol or some other product of fermentation. So here you can see some of the common microbial fermentations. Again, remember I said some microbes are like us. They take pyruvate directly and reduce it to lactate, uh, also known as lactic acid, uh, and that's how they regenerate NAD+. Uh, other mo other uh, microbes, like uh, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, yeast, right, baker's yeast, which produces alcohol, First, yeast will convert their pyruvate to acetaldehyde, releasing carbon dioxide, and then they will reduce the acetaldehyde with NADH to ethanol. That's how they regenerate their NAD+. And that's also why you end up with ethanol. This is called alcohol fermentation. And then there's a host of others uh, you, can, you can convert, but, it, but notice the common theme. Pyruvate is converted to some... some uh, byproduct, which is converted to another, converted to another, converted to another, then reduced to propionic, to, uh, propionic acid. Um, pyruvate can be converted to acetoin and then reduced to butendiol, butanediol. A pyruvate can be used to form uh, formate and then hydrogen gas and CO2. It can be used to pr uh, produce butyric acid, Butendiol or butanol, isopropanol, acetate, ethanol. You see, these are all different uh, fermentation products, and different microorganisms produce a different fermentation product. And we can use that to our advantage in food production. We can use it to form alcoholic beverages, to produce alcoholic beverages, to in bread rising, yogurt, sauerkraut, pickle, cheese production, etc. Lastly, let's review photosynthesis. All right, phototrophy, using light as an energy source. All right, this should also be a review of biology 1406, but let's touch on it briefly. If you, when you have your chloroplast, remember the chloroplast is the photosynthetic organelle uh, in eukaryotes. You have your outer membrane, you have your inner membrane, and then you have stacks of membrane called uh, granum. Each individual, I call it, each individual pancake in the stack, I call it, each individual unit of the stack is called a thylakoid. And then you have the thylakoid membrane. And outside you have the stroma. The fluid out here is called the stroma. Then you have the thylakoid membrane, and inside of these thylakoid, inside of the granum, you have the thylakoid space or thylakoid lumen. So take a look here at the thylakoid membrane. This would be the membrane of the pancake stacks. This membrane has uh, photosystem two, photosystem one. It has a small electron transport chain known as cytochrome B complex. And then you have your ATP synthase as well. You have all of these components inside of the thylakoid membrane. On this side of the membrane, you have the stroma. On this side, the stroma. The top side is the stroma, the fluid you know, outside of the stacks. And on this side, you have the thylakoid lumen, so inside of the stacks. And remember how photosynthesis works from biology 1406. Water 
donates two electrons to P680 plus, reducing it to P680. And as a result, water gets oxidized to oxygen. And that is a waste product of photosynthesis oxygen. This is why plants and photosynthesizers give off oxygen. Now that P680 has obtained electrons from water, when sunlight energy, remember photons, photons of light hit the uh, photosystem too, remember where the light hits, uh, the light's collected by the light harvesting complex of photosystem two, where chlorophyll molecules and other accessory pigment molecules, they, they, funnel, they funnel that excitement, that, that sunlight energy to the central chlorophyll pair called P680, P680, then uh, the electrons move to a higher energy state. So the electrons actually leave P680. P680 releases the electrons. The electrons move from cofactor to cofactor until they move to the uh, primary electron acceptor. And from there, they leave the photosystem. They leave the photosystem, travel through this electron transport chain, and they end up on the central chlorophyll pair of photosystem one. They end up here on photosystem one, on this central chlorophyll pair. And one thing you should realize is as the electrons moved through this electron transport chain called cytochrome B complex, that was a spontaneous movement of electrons that released energy. That process of electron flow released energy. And, and the cytochrome B complex utilized that energy in order to pump, actively pump protons into the lumen, the thylakoid lumen. So protons were actively transported from the stroma into the thylakoid lumen, uh, and thereby you produce a high concentration of protons in the thylakoid lumen or thylakoid space. Okay, picking up where we left off with the electrons, they were stuck on P700 on photosystem one, Again, photons of light strike uh, pigment molecules in the light harvesting complex of P700. That excitement, that, that energy re reaches P700. P700 then releases electrons because it, 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 remember that these central chlorophyll pairs act like a reduction potential switch. They have a very positive uh, EO reduction potential when they are oxidized and they have a very negative reduction potential once they are reduced and once that electro the the photon energy reaches them as well so once they once they reach uh, once they're energized by photons of light and they're reduced they will switch to a negative reduction potential releasing the electrons the electrons move to a uh, uh, pyridine nucleotide reductase and basically this is your NADP plus reductase. That's normally known as NADP plus reductase. The electrons are given to NADP plus and NADP plus is reduced to NADPH. And that is a product of the light reactions of photosynthesis. Now keep in mind, you also built up a lot of uh, proton concentration in the thylakoid lumen. Those protons will flow through chemiosmosis, generating a proton motive force through ATP synthase, thereby spinning ATP synthase and providing the energy for ATP synthase to produce ATP by phosphorylating ADP with an inorganic phosphate. All right, and this process, by the way, is known as photophosphorylation. So again, um, the what you needed for photosynthesis this is these are the light reactions of photosynthesis what you needed was water and you needed photons of light and I guess you also needed NADP plus then as products of the light reactions of photosynthesis what did you produce you produced the waste product oxygen you produced NADPH and through production of a proton uh, gradient you were able to produce ATP via photophosphorylation. So those are your products of the light reactions of photosynthesis. And then recall Calvin cycle comes next during photosynthesis. These are known as the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle in general. 
but recall that they can occur in the light or the dark. Here, uh, carbon fixation is occurring. Carbon fixation. What does that mean? CO2 is being taken out of the air, just out of the air. CO2 is taken out of the air, and in this amazing process, this enzyme Rubisco, the enzyme Rubisco joins carbon dioxide with this organic molecule called ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP to produce this short-lived intermediate and then that short-lived intermediate gets cleaved into 3-phosphoglycerate and so what have you done? You have captured CO2 from the air and you've fixed it to an to an organic molecule, a solid organic molecule. It's fascinating. So this is how you've captured carbons. You've captured carbon and oxygen. Next, through with help from ATP that we have formed through the light reactions of photosynthesis, with the help of ATP, we can reduce our captured carbon and oxygen. We can reduce it and hand over hydrogens from NADPH, which was also formed during the light reactions of photosynthesis. So these H's are being given to this organic molecule, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and we've formed glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, which then goes on to form glucose which the, and other organic compounds. So again, what did we do? We took CO2 out of the air with the help of the enzyme Rubisco, that CO2 uh, is added onto RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, and then with the help of ATP and NADPH from the light reactions of photosynthesis, we were able to form sugars. Lastly, what we want to do is we want to invest some energy in order to regenerate this molecule, ribulose bisphosphate, in order to accept, because it's the CO2 acceptor, in order to accept the next incoming CO2 with the help of the enzyme Rubisco. So again, that should be a review of, uh, you know, Biology 1406 photosynthesis. If, if anything I have mentioned so far in this lecture regarding uh, aerobic cellular respiration, anaerobic cellular respiration, uh, fermentation, uh, photosynthesis, you know, light reaction, Calvin cycle, if any of this is confusing, please hop back to... Uh, you know, those videos that I linked earlier, that I mentioned earlier, that, you know, the Biology 1406 videos for a refresher. Because from now, I'm going to touch on some other neat slides from this lecture. And from those slides, we're going to distinguish what makes microorganisms so special and different from eukaryotes. So that's what we're going to do next. But first, let's take another quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket. And then we'll come back and, again, what we're going to do is fill in some blanks about what makes microorganisms different from the eukaryotes with respect to these processes. Welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Like I said before the break, what we're going to do now is highlight some important differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes with respect to metabolism. And one is this. This is fascinating. Recall that in eukaryotes, the proton motive force is used in the mitochondria to produce ATP with ATP synthase. But in prokaryotes, take a look. The proton motive force is used not just to produce ATP with ATP synthase, but it can be used to... Uh, uh, to drive bacterial flagella rotation, and it could be used for active transport. Why is this? Well, let me show you. In prokaryotes, okay, here, take a look here. In prokaryotes, what you have, recall, is the electron transport chain is in the plasma membrane. This is the plasma membrane of a prokaryotic cell. And here you would have the cytoplasm. And out here you have the environment, the environment around the cell. Now, look what happens. The protons are being pumped from inside of the cell out. 
So the proton gradient is higher outside of the cell versus inside of the cell, and chemiosmosis occurs through the plasma membrane, but not through the membrane itself, through ATP synthase. ATP synthase is in the plasma membrane. When, when the protons force their way in, you form ATP with ATP synthase, but this, AT, this uh, proton gradient in the environment can also drive in and uh, promote flagellar rotation. This, this, these protons in the environment can also drive their way in exert that proton motive force for active transport through transport proteins. So you see, in prokaryotes, electron transport chain and ATP synthase are in the plasma membrane, and the proton gradient is higher outside of the cell through active transport of protons out of the cell. Those protons return into the cell through chemiosmosis, exerting a proton motive force and that proton motive force is used for ATP production with oxidative phosphorylation, flagellar rotation, and other types of motility, and for active transport of nutrients into the cell. Isn't that fascinating? So that's one key difference I want you to know about how uh, this process works of uh, chemiosmosis and proton motive force between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Let's go on to the next main concept that I want you to know uh, that's different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Okay, here's another area I would like you to focus in on, and this is with regard to chemoheterotrophs and how they utilize um, uh, respiration or fermentation and what they gain from each. So remember, aerobic respirators are like you and me, uh, these are creatures that undergo cellular respiration with the help of the electron transport chain and oxygen is their terminal electron acceptor. Now, what you need to know is that some microorganisms do not uh, undergo aerobic respiration. Remember, some can undergo anaerobic respiration, which remember, this is very important that you remember that anaerobic respiration still entails uh, glycolysis, oxidation of pyruvate, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. However, the terminal electron acceptor is some molecule that's not uh, oxygen. So sulfate, nitrate, CO2, fumarate, etc. And recall that when we switch over from aerobic respiration and there's not enough oxygen, like when you hit the gym too hard, when we switch over from aerobic respiration to fermentation, our, um, our fermentation product is lactic acid, right, or lactate. Whereas other organisms might have the products um, ethanol, uh, isopropanol, uh, etc. There's many different uh, fermentation products. And I don't know if I mentioned it before, but recall that fermentation involves only glycolysis, so only two ATP are formed. And then remember that during aerobic respiration, you have, depending on what textbook you follow, but you can have uh, 30, uh, two, 32 uh, ATP form through aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration it's usually less it's less than 32 ATP formed but um, you know it's nowhere near the only two ATP that's formed during fermentation so the best for ATP uh, production per glucose is aerobic respiration followed by anaerobic respiration and the worst would be fermentation coming in at only two ATP formed. So let's move on to the next concept I want you guys to understand. Okay, I did want to touch on this slide. It had to do with anabolism instead of catabolism, which we've been talking about building stuff. This is a part of biosynthesis. Alpha ketoglutarate and oxaloacetate uh, are parts of the uh, citric acid cycle. And these are precursors, they can be used as precursors for several amino acids, 
and your oxaloacetate can also be converted into phosphoenol pyruvate, which is a precursor for glucose. Succinyl-CoA uh, can be used uh, for synthesis of cytochromes, chlorophyll, other uh, tetrapyrrol compounds, and acetyl-CoA is necessary for fatty acid biosynthesis. So you can see where the, some of the precursors are for some of the molecules that are built inside of the cell. Also, I wanted to touch on this, the glyoxalate cycle. The glyoxalate cycle utilizes uh, the citric acid cycle intermediates such as citrate, malate, fumarate, and succinate, uh, which are common products that can be readily catabolized through the citric acid cycle. So you could take these uh, acetate, uh, malate, succinate, uh, etc. And you can use them either in biosynthesis or you can use them in the citric acid cycle in order to gain energy from them, to, to, to oxidize them and use them in the COC, the citric acid cycle. So let's move on to the next concept that I wanted to touch on. Okay, cool. So we touched on the electron transport chain uh, followed by ATP synthase. This one would be from the uh, mitochondria of a eukaryote, for instance. But how would the electron transport chain, how would this, this process be different in prokaryotes? And that's what's explained here. Bacterial and archaeal electron transport chains. Again, these are located in the plasma membrane. Some resemble mitochondrial electron transport chain, because remember, mitochondria actually came from early bacterium once upon a time. That's, that's their origin story, so it's no wonder that uh, some bacteria have a ETC symbol, similar to current mitochondria. Uh, but many are different. How are they different? They could have different electron carriers. They could be branched. They could be shorter, or they might have a different PO ratio. And recall, we discussed the PO ratio. The PO ratio of NADH was 2.5 ATP per NADH, and the PO ratio of FADH2 was 1.5 uh, ATP per NADH. And if we use those PO ratios, we can actually count out the 32 net ATP for uh, you know, cellular respiration, uh, aerobic cellular respiration, that is. Because look here, during glycolysis, you formed two net ATP, and but you also formed two NADH. And recall, those two NADH will travel to the electron transport chain where these two NADH will ultimately yield you five ATP. Why? Because remember the PO ratio, each NADH yields 2.5 ATP. So 2-NADH will yield 5 ATP. So total from glycolysis, you are going to net 7 ATP. 2 via substrate level phosphorylation directly there in glycolysis, and 5 subsequently through oxidative phosphorylation at the electron transport chain or after the electron transport chain. And then do you remember there was a half step here where pyruvate got oxidized to acetyl-CoA called pyruvate oxidation? During pyruvate oxidation, no ATP was created directly, but two NADH was created. Those two NADH travel to the electron transport chain. They pick up the electrons, um, you know, they drop off the electrons, and those electrons ultimately yield five more ATP. Again, because two times 2.5 PO ratio is five ATP. So now you've got seven plus five, 12 ATP from your glucose molecule. That acetyl-CoA then goes to the you know, to the TCA cycle, yielding two, two full turns of the TCA cycle to give you six NADH, to, uh, and six times 2.5 would be 15 more ATP, two FADH2, two times 1.5 would be three ATP, and then two GTP, or ATP you could call it, through substrate level phosphorylation. This will yield you a total of 32 ATP. So the net aerobic yield for prokaryotes is 32 ATP. And here's one more difference I'd like you to know. Your textbooks would talk about how uh, eukaryotic 
aerobic respiration would yield 30 ATP, whereas prokaryotic, a, a, prokaryotic aerobic respiration would yield 32. Do you know why? Well, because you need to utilize 2 ATP to get pyruvate into the mitochondria in eukaryotes. There is no mitochondria to worry about in prokaryotes, so in prokaryotes you net 32 ATP, but in uh, eukaryotes you net only 30 ATP, and that's because you have to bring the pyruvate into the mitochondria, and that requires two, the use of 2 ATP, so you're going to net 2 fewer ATP. All right, so how are fats broken down? I did want to touch on how lipid catabolism works. How are, how are triglycerides, or fats, broken down? They are a common energy source. Well, they're hydrolyzed to glycerol and fatty acids. Remember that uh, a fat is composed of a glycerol head with three fatty acid tails. The enzyme lipase can cleave those fatty acid tails from glycerol. Glycerol can be degraded with the glycolysis, you know, the glycolytic pathway, and the fatty acids are oxidized via beta oxidation pathway, where during the beta oxidation pathway, two carbons are released from the fatty acid tail at a time and then fed into the citric acid cycle for further oxidation and uh, release of, uh, or, or, or harvesting of hydrogens to feed into the electron transport chain for ATP production. Okay, and one, one more difference I wanted you to know about was during phototrophy, which means using light as an energy source, there are photoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs. Photoautotrophs, these behave like uh, plants and trees, you know, algae, the eukaryotes. These use ATP and CO2 for biosynthesis whereas photoheterotrophs use ATP and organic carbon for biosynthesis. Here you can see kind of the difference between the two. During chlorophyll-based photo uh, phototrophy, light is used for energy. The, the light is harvested you know, by these uh, pigment molecules, chlorophyll or bacterial chlorophyll. And then uh, some kind of uh, inorganic, inorganic uh, electron source like water you know, water is used as the inorganic electron source to drive an electron transport chain. Those electrons are harvested by NADP plus to form NADPH. That drives the protons into the thylakoid, if it's a eukaryote, into the thylakoid space, or if it's a prokaryote, into the cytoplasm. Um, and then you can form ATP, you know, because the, the protons the the proton the proton gradient by the way is 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 higher in eukaryotes in the thylakoid space but in prokaryotes the proton gradient is higher outside of the cell those protons then force their way into the cell driving ATP synthase to form ATP uh, with photophosphorylation okay and here your carbon source remember we're talking about a photoautotroph your carbon source is often CO2 through carbon fixation. Remember, you've got carbon fixation going on. You use that carbon for biosynthesis. But remember here with photoheterotrophs, um, here's an example, rhodopsin-based phototrophy, light is harvested not by chlorophyll, but by bacterial rhodopsin. And that energy is used to drive a proton motive force and then to get ATP, uh, again, through photophosphorylation. But in this case, your carbon source is not CO2 through carbon fixation. It is CO2, it's carbon via an organic molecule of some sort. An organic molecule is used for biosynthesis. So you can see that's a key difference between uh, the rhodopsin-based uh, photo, photo, phototrophy and chlorophyll-based phototrophy. All right, and as your final uh, note from this chapter, uh, the light reaction in anoxygenic photosynthesis. So in anoxygenic photosynthesis, oxygen is not produced during photosynthesis. 
Why? Because water is not used as the electron source. If water is not used as the electron source, water is not oxidized to oxygen, so oxygen is not produced. These systems use one photosystem, not two, and they use bacterial chlorophylls and mechanisms to generate reducing power. The, the organisms that do this anoxygenic photosynthesis are the green bacteria, um, the purple bacteria, and the heliobacteria. All right, and that leads us to the end of the chapter. All right, I think that's it. That was a doozy of a chapter, I know, but again, if you don't recall some of these concepts of photosynthesis, of cellular respiration, fermentation, aerobic cellular respiration versus anaerobic cellular respiration, um, you know, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, etc. You know, again, watch those videos uh, from Biology 1406 because they are good and they break down those concepts simply step by step. I didn't have time to go into all of those details in this chapter because uh, I had other slides to introduce where we're uh, juxtaposing eukaryotic versus prokaryotic systems. But I hope you took away some interesting things about the microbes. Um, so again, as always, leave any comments or questions you have in the box below, and I'll catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.